Okay, as in go. Sorry, one second. Fork Tales, a podcast that feeds the food and beverage world. Oh, awesome. Fork Tales is brought to you by Vigor, a branding and marketing agency for passion driven, innovative restaurant, beverage, and hospitality brands. Learn more at vigorbranding.com. If you love what we're serving up, please give Fork Tales a five star review on your podcast service of choice. Think of it as a tip for good service. Hey everyone, today I'm joined by Chip Close. He's the host of the Restaurant Strategy Podcast, amongst many other things. Um, but rather than trying to un- unroll his litany of uh, touch points on his uh, resume, I'll let Chip give yourself a-, a bit of an introduction. Say hello. Thanks so much. I appreciate you having me on here. Um, yeah, I-, I don't even know where to start. Uh- I've been a-, a restaurant professional for the last 20 years. Uh, I've lived here in New York City for 18 years. Um, worked my way up to just about everything you can do in a restaurant, started as a host and, and a server and a captain and a maitre d', and then I get into management. Um, and then I switched over to the marketing side. So I kind of took all of that operations, uh, operational experience, uh, leveraged kind of all the marketing stuff I was learning uh, and became a restaurant consultant. Uh, so that's really what I've been doing the last six years or so, uh, really helping chefs and operators, um, you know, build out their digital presence um, and, and, tackle some of the fundamentals because I think it's um, it's often overlooked. Um, that kind of led, gave way to uh, the podcast. Uh, that was a direct extension from the work I was doing uh, with chefs, with operators. And mm-hmm. uh, that's been going on for the last two years. Um, so it's all kind of swirled up into one. Yeah, that, that's a great story. It's not dissimilar from mine, except I think yours might have been a little more intense. I started mopping the floors of a bagel shop and then worked my way the whole way up into like, you know, management and everything. And uh, I think I think once you get into the industry, part of you probably finds some things that you don't like all that much uh, with, uh, with the with the day to day, but finds a lot of things that you love. And then we end up as consultants. I don't know. Um, so with that, what, what are some pet peeves of yours when it comes to uh, the marketing, the digital space in restaurants. I mean, working with them hand in hand and also being a part of one for a while, I'm sure there are things that just grate against you when you see them. Uh, yeah. What does it look like? Yeah, you know what? And, and you know, you and I probably uh, have this in common, but for me, it's um, my biggest pet peeve. The, the thing that really drives me the most crazy is how chefs and operators um, skip the first step. Skip the fundamentals. This is a key piece to what I do. You know, when you hire me, when you listen to the podcast, this is what you're going to get. This understanding, and we'll get into it over the course of this conversation, but the fundamentals, right? Like, like things haven't changed, right? People want to come in and have something to eat. We're going to take care of them. We hope mm-hmm. that they have a good time and they come back. We hope that they tell people about us. You know, that hasn't changed, right? We're, the need for word of mouth hasn't changed. The way word of mouth happens has changed, right? The, the tools, the media, but um, but the fact that we still need word of mouth, that's the same as it was 100 years ago as it was 200 years ago. So for me, it's this idea of uh, so many uh, restaurant owners uh, come into it with uh, what I call this this field of dreams complex, right? Mm-hmm. If I build it, they will come. Um, that, that there's this thing of like, oh, I, I want to do this kind of food. I want to make this kind of restaurant and, and, and people will come, which uh, anybody who's worked in the restaurant uh, industry long enough knows that that is rarely the case, unless it's a celebrity chef, unless it's a great location, unless it's, you fill in the blank. But for most places, um, that, that field of dreams approach just doesn't work. Um, so when I approach uh, marketing, uh, I try to, to tackle that right away. You know, make sure that we're assessing the market, that we understand who we're trying to serve. We understand what they need, what the neighborhood needs, what that block needs, what the city needs. And then we uh, and then we create a product. We create an experience um, that fills that need, that that has a specific audience. That's what marketing is, right? Figure Mm -hmm. out what people need, craft a, you know, craft a something, right? A widget, a product, an experience, a service um, that the people need. uh, And then just make sure everybody who who would love that knows about that and and then it gets more complicated and nuanced for sure. But my biggest pet peeve is that people jump right over those early things, right? Who are you? Who are you for? You know, what problem are you solving? 
How are you different than the competitors? Who, you know, where else do your people go? Um, and, and how do you stand out from that? And we just go right to like menu building and, you know, we're sourcing this from this purveyor and we're so excited about these flavors. It's like, whoa, 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 time out. Yeah. Time out. <laughs> and, uh, and we found a spot and we love it and it's beautiful. And we're going to call it John's house of food. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that's that is uh, that is my biggest pet peeve that that they just don't right what every other industry does what every other business does they <laughs> they assess the market that's what marketers do you see if there is a market you see if there's an opening in the market you see if there's a need that you can fill right what are you uniquely qualified uh, to provide what, what can you fit in there you know and and restaurants you know the, the average restaurant lasts you know three years you mm-hmm. know most restaurants don't make it past five. Um, those are those are like heady numbers, and we know them. We hear that over and over again, um, and yet still people like ignore them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think Field of Dreams. Uh, so, so it's a great it's a great analogy. Uh, I'm going to bring the youngsters up a little bit. Um, so Field of Dreams was a movie with Kevin Costner, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he played a farmer, and um, he started hearing voices in the field. Uh, if you build it, they will come, and uh, it gets to kind of like a tipping point for him. And then he clears out a large part of his field and creates a baseball field in the middle of Nebraska, no baseball team. And then the ghosts of a baseball team show up to play and people show up to watch them and everything's wonderful. Um, But that analogy, I think, is actually incredibly profound, not just for that quick, if you build it, they will come. And this may sound like a challenge to what you're saying, but I'll I'll get through it. I promise it's not. Um, If you build it, they will come. Some people are going to come in the front door and it's going to look like, hey, we got we got a winner here. Look at these people coming in. But that's just a a wave of newness that eventually crashes. And then you're left with whatever the tide is congruent to what you've done to make it as big as it should be. And um, and what's funny about Field of Dreams is, if I'm not mistaken, they play the game. The ghosts play their game. Uh, one of the ghosts is his father. And so there's a tearjerker moment. And I'm sorry if I'm ruining the movie, but people probably weren't going to watch it anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, and then they go away forever. And he's just left with his baseball field that he spent a lot of money building. And, uh, you know, that's yep. really incredibly profound because that's that's – What I see so much of with startup uh, restaurants and you do too, where it's like you just sunk a million dollars into like the, the time, the effort, the build, the, all the things that go out of your pocket to bring this vision and this dream to life without ever asking, will it even work? Like, will it float? You know? (laughs) Do Yeah. Do I mean, this is that Pat Flynn thing, right? He's so um, he's got that book. Will it fly? And it's this idea of like, you know, like, will it fly? Does it have legs? Does it, is it going to make it past that that stage of that new novel, that shiny, that exciting thing? Um, it's it's a real thing, right? Does it does it have staying power? Is it the kind of place mm-hmm. that people want to come back to over and over and over again? Or if it's just a once in a lifetime place, do you have enough people who are willing to travel in from all over the world, you know, to just have their one meal there, right? And have, you, you got to have a plan for this stuff. Yeah, yeah, you can't just uh, run into the dark, you know with your fist out, hoping to hit something, you know? And uh, so that, I mean, I think, I think consultants and what I would call successful restaurants, restaurateurs also have that, that same pet peeve where it's like, guys, this is all great. Everyone can get absolutely drunk on the idea of creating this new thing because who doesn't love restaurants? Uh, But take a step back and like, do, do some math. You don't even need a spreadsheet. Just get a pencil. And, uh, yeah. And just start putting some numbers down. Like, will this have a return on investment? And be, besides the emotional wonder of being able to tell your friends that you own a restaurant. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny is that one of the things that I'm really outspoken about is this idea of profitability in the restaurant industry, because mm-hmm. we know that double digit profit margins are like a unicorn. If you if you have the kind of space um, that, that brings in 10, 12, 14 percent, it's like, oh, oh my God, what, what are you? What are you doing? Um, and that's weird to me, right? Like, like no other industry, no, no one else goes into business in any other market uh, without guaranteeing 20, 25% profit margin on, on the top, right? That's how you build a pro forma financials, right? Like right. you say, you know, what, you know, what's <laughs> that NPV, right? The, the net present value. What, uh, what is the next 10 years? You know, what's the value of the next 10 years, you know, realistically, you know, today? And, and uh, is it worth, you know, e- executing? And, and so few people in the restaurant industry really stop to, to think about that. 
Yeah. And so I'm going to tap into something we hadn't really planned on talking about, but here we are. So, so you're in New York. You deal, uh, from what I could tell, with um, predominantly New York restaurants, um, mostly one, two, three locations, maybe. Uh, New York is such a different beast, uh, the city, that is, um, meaning just walking down the street, especially in some key neighborhoods in Manhattan, let alone Brooklyn and Queens, like there's like 10 restaurants a block, you know, yeah. and it fierce, fierce competition. So when you're, when you're like in the room with, um, you know, your people, how do you, man, how do you even begin to profile competition? How do you even begin to look at it? Yeah. I mean, it's a horrible place to launch a business. I mean, it's, it's, you know, unbelievably expensive, you know, rents are 20, 30, 40, 50, $80,000, depending on hmm. your location. If you're on an Avenue or a street, you know, how many square footage, whether you've got a kitchen downstairs. I mean, it's like ludicrous, but yeah, it's, it's, it's that expensive. Like, but making the case even more, like even more, uh, it's even more important uh, to make sure that you're um, that you're doing your due diligence here and and understanding it. Interestingly enough, is that uh, so? I've been here in New York for eighteen years, and yeah, most of my clients over the mm-hmm. years um, have been here in New York. Uh, but since the pandemic, uh, I've now brought three different clients on uh, from outside the city, uh, and that's a lot of my work right nice. now. One in South Carolina, and two different uh, companies out in California. And this is something that I've realized, something I'm really passionate about. Uh, which is, you know, taking all that, you know, I said, you know, taking all that operational experience, you know, all the systems, the routines, all of that from, you know, important restaurants and bringing them to just mom and pop restaurants, to independent uh, restaurants. I'm working with a, a group right now that's expanding from three locations to five locations. Um, and there are just some basics that they just don't do. Mm-hmm. And it's really satisfying work to be able to show them like, oh, no, this is how we this is how we food costs. This is how this is the best way to run a P-Mix. This is the best way to you know, manage your labor costs. This is how you should be confirming reservations. Things that uh, I know, like I took for granted and I realized like, well, they've just never thought about this. We have to think about it in New York uh, because the real estate is so precious. We have to confirm every reservation. Yeah. We have to release tables to the wait list so that we can maximize, you know, every seat in there. Um, and so that, that's been really interesting and really satisfying too. And it's, it's all the same stuff, um, you know, heightened here in New York city. Um, you just have to, you just have to know who you are and who you're for that much more. Yeah. Talk about like testing whether or not it flies. I think New York city would be the, uh, the gauntlet for that. Um, you know, and, you, and you've seen brands that, uh, start up outside of the city and then try to enter in and quickly cut tail and run because, you know, they just, they just don't have the business model for that particular location. Yeah. Um, they come in maybe adjusting their prices a little bit, but not where they need to be. And I think that's going to be a really big teller of um, of who wins and who loses as we're coming out of the pandemic and uh, into what's next. And that is your numbers have to work. The you numbers know? have to work. And coming out of the pandemic, I mean, this was always true, and it is especially true now. You have to give people a compelling reason to join you. Right. We all mm-hmm. stayed at home for a year and we learned how to cook. We got pretty good at it. Um, mm-hmm. We saved a lot of money. I think a lot of people saw how much money they saved and said, oh, wow, that's like that was like 10 grand. I put, uh, you know, I was able to put away uh, those that kept their job and, and, and still kept working through here. And all that money you spend, you know, 200 bucks here, 100 bucks here, you know, drinks at this place, dinner at that place. And suddenly you just did it all at home. And, and I think people uh, were able to save money, um, mm-hmm. whether that will that trend will continue. Uh, you know, w- remains to be seen, but I think people learn something. Uh, so I- I'm really interested in kind of the long term trends. Like even if it dips down like 10, percent that's devastating to the the industry. Uh, but we have to be ready for that. I think and to the industry and every local economy. Every, absolutely, you know, yeah. people don't understand the weight that restaurants, not just the McDonald's and and, and the franchise systems of the world, which are important. And I want to make sure that anyone listening realizes that. Uh, just as a side note, like. The McDonald's down the street, it ain't owned by McDonald's. It's owned by John and Jane Smith, who put their life yeah. savings. In, in, you know, they're local people. They're, they're they're your neighbors. And so I feel like a lot of people did this, save the restaurants, screw the big corporations. But it's like, no, 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 no. Like, they're they're part of it. They're really yeah. important. You yeah. know? Um, I kind of forget where I was going with that. Oh, yeah. So one of the other things, too, is not only do people save money, but a lot of people, um, they upped the ante. And I don't think a lot of restaurants realize that. So I was just recently in Nolens, really excited about the food there. And I had some fantastic meals. It didn't let down some of the time. But man, I had some meals that I paid a decent amount of money for where, I'll put it this way. I had to ask for salt 
for one of my meals. I've never had to do that in my entire life. And it's not because I have some weird salt need. Um, but during the pandemic, I went from being a passable cook to a really good cook. And maybe not for everyone, but definitely for myself and my own tastes. Therefore, when I now go to eat out, I don't care if it's 20 or $200. The food better be really, really good. Yeah, this is something that you're hearing a lot about. Like, oh, when people come back out to dine, when the world comes back, people are going to be so much more forgiving, you know, of flaws in service or this and that. And this is, I, I hear this over and over again. And to your point, I, I totally disagree. I agree with what you're saying. I think we will look more carefully at the, um, at the money we're spending. Um, and I think we will, not that we're going to judge the meal, but we're going to, the bar has been raised. I think we're going to have higher expectations because uh, we could, you know, again, we, we just learned. And if I'm going to come out and spend my hard earned money moving forward, uh, it better be worth it. You better mm -hmm. you know, take care of me. And I don't think that's in a, in a flippant or cynical way. I just think um, that's a new reality. And again, there's a trend here and we're going to see it, you know, is that going to be obvious right away? No, but I think over the next 12 to 24 months, we're going to feel that. And again, mm -hmm. uh, if people go out 10% less than they did before the pandemic, that is a huge shift in every single market, uh, urban, suburban, rural, that that's a big deal. And if people then don't come back because they're less forgiving or they've got a, a higher bar, um, that also changes the dynamic of every market everywhere across the country. Yeah, yeah, it's the, it's it's almost the. Um, I think people want people to be more understanding, but there's another layer there too. Not only are people um, going out to eat with higher expectations, they're going out to eat with a certain level of fear that they have chosen to uh, withstand because even though we're, we're hitting all the vaccinations, even though we're like doing such a great job and we're finally, you know, getting that, that uh, the legs underneath us to get out of this pandemic, the fear is still very palpable. It's still very there, uh, very much there to where the question before deciding uh, what restaurant to go to, the question is, do we even want to go out? You know? That's so true. I did a podcast episode about this a couple of uh, weeks ago. So I'm writing a book and I'm about halfway through it now. And and I'm trying to think it's challenging assumptions and, and really a bunch of mindset shifts, really, you know, inviting people to rethink, you know, how we think of the industry now, you know, post pandemic, right, to, to bring more to it, um, to be more deliberate about it. And I did an episode about transactions, value and price. And mm -hmm. there are three words that get thrown around and, and we say, OK, well, we, we know what that is. Um, but one of the things that I really wanted the listeners to think about was that, you know, price goes beyond uh, the money that we charge for that, right? That, that halibut is $22. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's a renewable resource. We can go get more money. We can go work more money. I mean, we can go work more, get more money, and come back and, and, and eat more food next week. The things that aren't on the menu, the things that aren't being charged, but are very much part of the transaction are time, attention, and trust. Mm -hmm. on the consumer side, right? That we pay with money, of course, but we pay with our time, our attention, and our trust. And I think those are really big things. And I think uh, they've always been big, but coming out of this pandemic, I think whether people consciously or subconsciously, that will factor into it. it prices will go up. That, that's inevitable. Um, right. the, the prices of restaurants, uh, dining out is going to be more expensive. And like I said at the beginning of this conversation, right, you're going to have to provide people with a compelling reason to come join you and a compelling reason to come back and a compelling reason to talk about you, to, to rave about you, to post that review, to, to take a picture and post it to your account, right? Like all of that is is part of marketing. Mm -hmm. um, but at the, at the very core, right, and again, this, these fundamentals, we got to answer key questions for people. You know, why should I come out? Why should I join you? Why here as opposed to there? Um, and, yep. and how we answer that. Um, I think it will be the the deciding line between winners and losers moving forward. It's a hundred percent true, and and so I've I've tried to um, guide some some uh, guests to the pond. We'll see if I can do it for you because it hasn't worked so far. But I'm going to instead of asking you, I'm just going to come out and say it and let you contradict me or or argue it. I think the casual dining space should be shaking in their boots. I think they, they should be knocking their knees. I think that they are staring obliv oblivion in the face, honestly. And I'm going to be that dramatic about it because for everything we just said, I will go out 
you know, we, we have the means. So I will go out with my wife and we will spend two, $300 on a really good meal. If that meal and that service does not exceed the expectation, let alone meet it, I'm not going back. Now, pull that fine dining or that, that elevated dining out and bring me a casual dining experience. Maybe it's a tavern. Maybe it's a, you know, I want to say a bar, but like, um, you know, just something that's more t-shirts and jeans come hang yep. out. The food there, they're charging probably what they should based on market and, and costing, but the food is not good. And there's just no other way of saying it. It's not worth the money. It's not worth the risk because, again, we have that fear. And the the service is usually eh, which is only going to be worse because we're having a hard time finding people, uh, people that want to work, people that are good at their job. And then I look over to fast casual that are delivering arguably better food in an experience that's lower touch for a price that is more approachable. And I have to ask, like, why the hell am I even here? Why would I even go to that that concept that's full service and casual? Uh, I, so what what are your thoughts? <laughs> I could not agree more. And I want the names and addresses of the people who disagreed with you. Um, <laughs> there was a big move. In fact, there was an article in the New York Times over the summer. Uh, and they were talking about Australia down. Um, uh, one of the uh, correspondents was down in Melbourne. And mm-hmm. she was saying that like she was already seeing it because they had cleaned up the pandemic uh, long before we had. And she said, yeah. you know, look, I, like I'm, I've got a crystal ball. I, I'm looking into it. And said everything in the middle was just was just vanishing. It was like oil and water. They were running to opposite ends of the poles. Uh, that half of them were were coming up with a more elevated experience. Even some like casual bars, like like little tapas bars and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea was that like, nope, it's a six course tasting menu, and this is what it is. It's a series of small plates. But they needed number one to make sure there was a certain dollar amount because they were. At, capacity restrictions, right. but they also needed to justify the reason to come out. Why should you come out? Because we're going to take great care of you. It's going to be a series of small plates, no frills and all, you know, but like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we're elevating the experience a, a certain amount. And then uh, another batch of restaurants were, were going more casual. I could not agree more. And again, it's this idea of uh, restaurants are going to have to provide compelling reasons to come join you. Obviously fast food, um, uh, QSR, all, all of those um, they have a compelling reason, right? You're going to grab a sandwich on your way somewhere. You're going to grab mm-hmm. a, a bite here on your way to work. You're going to grab coffee and a bagel sandwich here. Like that is inevitable, right? Though you're going to need, eventually we are going to move back to the office and we're going to need a quick lunch, right? We have to go down get a salad, bring it back up to the office. Right. Those will succeed because they fill a very uh, specific and important need. And then, like you said, likewise, fine dining. We always want to go celebrate. We have birthdays, we have anniversaries, graduations, promotions, all of that. Mm-hmm. We will have those experiences. So 80%, right, of the restaurants that, you know, in this country, let's say, are in the middle. And I don't know how, I don't know how you make, what's the compelling argument to come join you for mediocre food, you know, at price points that are higher than you were used to, and certainly higher than you can, than you can uh, make at home. I, I and service totally that's agree. substandard, you know? I, I, yeah, I mean, and this is, you know, we, we've had conversations, you know, offline before this about kind of the future of service, right? Is there a way to separate service from hospitality? Um, right. We've, we've always thought of those as connected for a long time. Uh, but, you know, restaurants, as we know them, have been around 250 years. And they've basically gone unchanged. Yes, we've injected computers uh, or technology into uh, the steps of service into that customer journey, right? We used to write on little dupe pads, rip it off, give it to the chef, mm-hmm. and now we've got a computer system to tap it in. But it's the same system. It's the same function. Uh, likewise, we used to take reservations on a big reservation book, and now we've got, you know, there's table management software and, and different ways of doing that. Same thing. Nothing has really changed in what I think is going to happen over the next, I think it's going to happen really quickly. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to have to figure out that middle ground because I don't think every restaurant in this country certainly need servers or servers in the way that we're used to having them, right? 10 servers on the floor running a four table station. Like, I just don't think so. Like yeah. we, we, we got phones, we've got, you know, everything the waiter does is wildly inefficient. They spend half right. the night either, you know, at the table asking us what we want, writing it down. We're going over to the corner and tapping it into the terminal, you know, regurgitating it there. Like yep. there, there's a better way. Here it is. Here, just pick it Absolutely. up. An iPad on the table. Uh, certainly, you know, they're big brands, right? McDonald's learned this, you know, 10, 12 years ago at the kiosks, 
right? It's a more yep. efficient use. And they actually didn't cut payroll all that much. But what they did is they made a better guest experience. So you come in and the number one reason um, that individual McDonald's units um, suffered or failed is because the lines were too long. People would come in, see the line and say, I can't get this food quick. I'm going to go. Right. And they went to Wendy's or Burger King or Taco Bell, one of the other places right around the corner. So it, it, I mean, it took them, what, 60 years, 70 years to realize if we can just cut down the line at the front. And that's what kiosks did. You come in. So yep. kiosks make for a better guest experience. It's fun, right? You gamify it. Um, there are also ways it's been proven. Uh, they increase 10, you know, uh, check average 10 to 15 percent every single order because the computer can sell better than anybody at the register can. Absolutely. And then. And more consistently. Can, and more consistently. Yeah. And, and you can, and listen, here's the other thing. And then we can track it. We can quantify it. We can, you know, we can test it. You yep. know, we can't test a, a human interaction in the same way. Say, did somebody think that that person was giving them attitude when they asked for, if they wanted an <laughs> apple pie, like we can't, you know, we can't, um, we can't judge that in the same way. So, you know, in the same way, the kiosks kind of, you know, revolutionized McDonald's and made them even more profitable and PS made for a better guest experience. Mm -hmm. I think there is something coming for restaurants as well. I'm working with uh, the brand that I'm, uh, that I'm working with down in South Carolina. We are doing this. They are getting ready to open a, like a 600 seat, um, uh, you know, like group hub oh, wow. in the fall. And they reached out and that's the reason we started the conversation. So I've been hearing you talk all about this yeah. and I know I can't hire enough servers to keep this place staffed. And so there's a new way to do it. And I think, uh, I, I think, uh, we can do it with table ordering and, and all of that. And all my team thinks I'm crazy. And then I turn on your podcast and you're talking about how this is the way of the future. He's like, I want you, I want to hire you and help me implement it and make it profitable. And it's like, it's a no brainer. So we're, you know, we're now turning the other properties over um, so that we can get our ducks in a row for that one. But there is a future where it's a better guest experience. We can drive more revenue and cut expenses. Why or oh, why would we not pursue that solution? Right. Yeah. And I, I imagine that scenario um, that that could very well be the savior of um, casual dining. Cause I think casual dining still has a place, but it doesn't Agreed. have a place in the, in like you said, the format that we're doing it. And, I, I almost would love to for the casual dining space. Well, first, people have to realize why there's a why there's another um, large issue facing restaurants. And that is the issue of labor, and everything we just talked about plays into that. So, um, one, people don't want to go work at a place where they feel that they're going to be unsafe. So, we still have this latent fear from pandemic. I shouldn't say latent; it's still very real fear of safety from the pandemic. So, I'm going to risk my life to go to work. Uh, I. I need that risk to be rewarded, but there's half capacity or worse. And the check averages are minuscule. Um, and so I'm, I'm walking away with barely a minimum wage. This isn't an argument for minimum wage. It's just in general, like this is, this is my reality. So why would I go bust my hump for eight to 12 hour shifts to walk away with a hundred bucks, you know, yeah. or, or something yeah. like that. Or and, less. um, or less. Yeah. And I, I'm not that, that number I pulled out of the air, but just I'm sure we could do some math on that. Um, and so now you have someone that's there, doesn't really want to be there, feels that they're risking their health to be there, knows they're not going to walk away with a lot of money, and you're expecting them to deliver really good service. And that that is just not human <laughs> yeah. at all. And here's the and here's the the whole conversation about this, right? Is that, you know, and it's it's a good word to talk about human, right? That what we're asking our waiters to do, for example, is to take orders, right? Just copy stuff down mm -hmm. and go regurgitate it, right? There's nothing human about that. Yes, there are some elements, right? There's there's an opportunity to, to explain or upsell or, or whatever, right? But for the most part, you're just copying stuff down and regurgitating it into the computer. But why can't we let the computers do the things that computers do really well, right? Uh, like take the order and send it to the kitchen efficiently uh, and effectively, uh, and cut out human error as much as possible, uh, which is, you know, another piece to this. We talk about food waste and food getting returned because, you know, the wrong sauce or the wrong temperature or whatever. So let, let's stick a pin in that for now. Mm -hmm. But then if we can, uh, if we can let the computers do, uh, you know, some of the heavy lifting here, then we have our servers on the floor, almost acting like, like little mini managers in there. And they can sure. actually engage. They can actually answer questions, upsell, guide the, you know, guide the experience because they don't have their, you know, they're all that time that they're normally spent, you know, just 
copying down orders or regurgitating them, they are in the station. They can yeah. see when somebody's ready for an, another cocktail. They can be there to pour off the first bottle of wine so that we can get the second bottle of wine. Because number one, it's good service, right? People yep. want their wine. And number two, it helps drive sales. People are more apt to order a second bottle of wine before the entrees hit yep. than after they hit. So like, there's there's a way here. Now, is this right for every restaurant? Absolutely not. But when yep. we talk about like casual restaurants, there is no reason why I need a server, uh, why 100%. I need a waiter at, at most of the places uh, you know that I would go to. To go in for a burger and a beer and all that, I can do that just fine on my phone, or you give me an iPad, something that you know you just show me quickly how to do it, make it you know make that user experience seamless, um, and and it's like a it's like a no brainer. Absolutely. So I think the word that we're dancing around, not saying, is it, it's time to step away from the idea of a server or a waiter, and introduce and build the idea of a steward because um, that's essentially what we're, we're looking for someone to be a steward of the people's experience, not an order taker and an order runner. And, and if you, if you have a world where people come um, sit down, you know, they're introduced, they're greeted, they're high fived, whatever. Um, and they're able to order as they need. And that steward comes over to just service the experience. That is a much different job. And there's a brand out there that I think is actually quite good at this, although I hesitate to laud them for anything. And that is Hooters. So, <laughs> okay. Like I, I'm not a big fan of the objectification of women. When I say not a big fan, I'm not into it at all. Um, I haven't been to a Hooters since I was like maybe 20. Um, but the, the, the people at Hooters, the women at Hooters know how to be a steward of the table and the experience. And I think I'm not saying that everyone has to be flirty or anything like that, but friendly or in line with the kind of brand experience that you're taking. And I'm excited for that. Like that would draw me into the brew pub. If, if I knew that I could go in there, order my stuff when I needed it, when I wanted it. And then I have someone come by, you know, chip come by. is like, Hey guys, what's up? How's it going, man? Are you celebrating anything? And just have a real engaging yeah, experience. Absolutely. Here's the most ludicrous thing, right? Is that we've taken a one size fits all approach and, and applied it to, uh, to an industry that's wildly different. Yep. Right. Like, like for the most part, even if you take, you know, okay, there's the, the QSR, the, 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 the uh, fast food model, right. There's that experience. Um, but every restaurant like above that, right. Every full, uh, full service restaurant from the pizza place to the sandwich shop, to the burger, you know, to the tavern, all the way up to Alinea and French lawn. Right. Okay. It's all the same thing. You sit there, you, you know, you're seated a minute or two later, somebody comes over and says, hi, welcome to you fill in the blank. Hi, welcome. We're so glad to have you. That's the same. And then after that, yeah, there might be little flourishes or, or other steps, you know, the higher up the, uh, the food chain you go, mm -hmm. but it's still the same. And so that's, I guess, what I'm coming to, which goes back to, you know, now bringing this conversation full circle, um, the conversation that I'm really interested in and, and what I find the most satisfying about my work with my clients and the work that we've been able to do on the podcast is that I'm just challenging assumptions, inviting people to rethink things. Mm -hmm. What is it you want to do? You want to feed people. You want to make sure people have a comfortable experience uh, for fill in the blank, right? Like go back all the way that far. Like, like what do I want? Or rather, what do these people need? What does my mm -hmm. audience, who can I serve? And what is it they need? This is why so many restaurants went belly up over the, um, you know, over the, uh, the pandemic. And I don't mean to, to minimize it. It was not easy. And I get that. But the people that I think didn't make it forgot that it was important to think of the guest. And so yeah. the, the whole idea, right? Like people were just used to doing things one way. Well, this is what we are. We're a restaurant. People come in, we feed them, they pay us, and then they leave. Rather than saying, we have an audience, we have a group of people who trusts us, right? There's that trust word again, who come into this restaurant for something, right? Mm -hmm. And now the government shut us down. It's a, it's a global pandemic. They can no longer come in for that experience. But guess what? There are still people out there. They are still your audience and they still need something. It's different than they wanted before. It's different than the things that they needed, but they still need something. And all the brands out there, all the restaurants that stopped, we talk about the pivot word, right? Everybody's sick of the pivot. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is that our people wanted, uh, needed us for this. We can no longer do this. What do they need now? And how are we uniquely qualified to provide them with that? And uh, I heard a really great interview with Nick Kokonis. I always talk about it. He was on the Tim Ferriss show. He did two interviews and one was kind of in the middle of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And he said, he's like, listen, all the places that just closed up, 
like they're dead, that they're never going to survive because the things, the people that stayed open, that struggled, that, that pivoted, that figured out another thing, uh, that was invaluable. What they learned about themselves and what they were capable of, what they learned about their audience and what they needed, and the connection, the relationship they built because you were trying, because right. you were trying to serve them in a new way. I think that is so profound, and I hope post-pandemic, we can bring that into whatever we do, and, and we can say that like, you know, it is about solving problems. It is about serving yep. the guest. What do they need? And then from there, build a restaurant. Then from there, build an experience, right? Rather than saying, well, this is a restaurant. This is how a restaurant runs. Say, who, want, who needs something? How can we provide that? And what's the best way to provide that? What's the most profitable way to provide that? Right. Yeah, we almost have uh, the same issue that was faced in uh, airplane design a long time ago where uh, the armed forces building airplanes for, for battle, um, I'm probably botching the, the story and the reality. So by all means, check me for uh, accuracy. But they're like, OK, OK, well, we got some tall guys. We got some short guys. Why don't we just like split the difference? We'll deliver a cockpit that is of average size and the deaths from airplane crashes because things were out of reach or things were so cramped that they couldn't operate effectively were um, were just astronomical until someone's like, what if we made the seat like movie back and forth, you know, where someone could adjust it? Ah, OK, let's do that. So this is what we're talking about as an adjustment. Um, so you've, you've talked about the the podcast and, and obviously you're the host of the podcast, amongst many other things. Uh, this is just a taste of chips podcast honestly it's it's great amazing insights so i have to ask the podcast on apple is 4.9 stars someone gave you a one star now was this a high school nemesis was this uh a bad interaction on the subway uh <laughs> how did this happen <laughs> i have no idea but i love it right there for for all the believers there are non-believers there's this great book called uh, primal branding it's by Patrick mm -hmm. Hanlon. It was, it's outstanding. I mean, it, it's just, it's really great. And one of the things they talk about, like there's like a recipe, you know, for, for really strong kind of brand identity. And one of the thing is the pagans, right? The non-believers. Um, that's mm -hmm. great. My show's not for everyone, right? And I, I say that I, it's very insidery. Um, it is directed towards chefs and small operators. So independent operators, small one, two, three units. That's who it's for. That's who I know uh, needs help. That's who I know I can help. So it's for them. And so yep. uh, I love it. I, you know, people come on and they've realized it's not for them. Great. Why they would leave a one star review. I don't know, but it is what it is. I, I'm not worried about it. I'm really <laughs> focused on again. And this is that this is that marketing conversation. I'm really focused in, on the on the audience that that I know I'm serving. Um, that is getting a lot out of it. And so um, mm -hmm. power to him. It's a, it's a free world. Leave me the one-star review. It's uh, you know, for every believer, there are many, many more non-believers. Yeah. It, it just makes me laugh when I see that. Cause I'm like that person, not, not only did they have to dislike the podcast, they had to go invest the time to give a bad review. And unlike restaurants, that just seems like a lot of hassle for like a podcast. If I don't like it, I'm just like, I'm just done listening to it. Um, yeah. But like, you must have to be like offended. That's why I'm like, Hey, did you see someone <laughs> on the subway and accidentally kick them and say, Hey, I'm chip close. Don't leave me a bad review. And like, have them be like, Oh, you know what? I'm going to. <laughs> the best part about podcasts here. And I always talk to like, like new podcasters and things like that. I was like, and this is the advice I give them. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm really nervous about starting it. I was like, here's the thing that's going to let all the pressure off. Nobody cares. Like, nobody cares. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the people that do care are going to find you and they're going to love you. And that's it. That's your tribe. Right. Like, so you're going to surround yourself with that. But like, for the most part, nobody cares. Like, like nobody, if, unless I told them, most people would never know that I have a podcast and I've interviewed, you know, some really big people, great people. I've had great conversations. Um, you know, I've, I've been invited yeah. into rooms because of the podcast and, and all of that. And, and I'm really grateful for that. And we're building a really strong community, but like at the end of the day, like nobody cares. Like, it's, it's like, it's very freeing. Yeah. <laughs> it's very freeing that way. It's good to know that. Yeah. I played in, in bands when I was younger, um, you know, in, in live on stages, played in New York a few times, CBGBs. Yeah. I'm name dropping. I know. <laughs> um, but one of the things we used to talk about is like, look, if we mess up the song, 
nobody knows. It's our it's our song. Yeah. <laughs> so like if we mess it up, just smooth through it. I mean, hell, I remember one time we were on stage in Brooklyn playing. It's a pretty decent sized show. And all of a sudden, I caught my lead singer singing lyrics to another band song. And I I, almost, I mean, I had to turn my back to the crowd because I started laughing because he just <laughs> forgot the lyrics. And I'm like, you know what? They had no clue. I mean, it's OK. It, it, again, it's it, it's very, very freeing. It's like nobody cares. Yeah. Nobody cares. And, and you know, right. and, and find joy in that. Right. Because, again, the, the flip side of that is that people who do care are going to care a great deal. And they're going to find you. They're going to rally around you. They're going to celebrate you. And, and that's who you're yeah. for. Exactly. So um, there are some things that I think people should care about. Uh, you mentioned a book that you're writing, but the bigger question here, what's on the horizon for Chip Close? What's coming down the pike? And then uh, keep on going and just plug all your stuff and we'll wrap this baby up. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, the podcast is uh, two years old now and that's going uh, really, uh, really, really well. Um, that community keeps growing. We've got a Patreon page that's like connected to it. And uh, now we have a private podcast that's connected to that, which I'm really, really enjoying. They're like daily five, uh, five minute episodes where I just like, you know, say this is what I'm thinking of, or this is, you know, something really tactical, really like nitty gritty. Um, that's a lot of fun. Um, so that yeah, will You just continue. gave a little taste of that, I believe. Yeah. Right. You just gave a little taste of those five minute spots a couple weeks it, ago. I did. Yeah. Uh, so, so people don't know what you're talking about. Listen to that. Yeah, get, yeah, give it a listen. It's episode number 107. And I took the very first week of the podcast, five short little episodes and put them back to back. So altogether, they're 25 minutes. Uh, but that's that's been a lot of fun. And, uh, and just working with these clients, I've uh, literally never been busier than I am right now. I just started with a new client that's going to be a big, big opening in the fall here in New York City. Um, and that's a really exciting product uh, project because I just don't know what it is. Like it's it's a theater and a restaurant. It's like a, it's like a variety theater. So it's going to be like music and oh, wow. comedy and magic and like cabaret. Like they don't even know what it is. Like I think it's it's going to be really interesting to, to piece that together. Uh, and the restaurant they're building right next door is gorgeous. Uh, we just got a walk through last week. Even though it's a war zone, you kind of get the walk through and then you, nice. uh, you look at the renderings. Uh, but yeah, that, that's that. And yeah, yeah writing a book. Although that's not that's not ready yet. That's a, that's about half done now. All right. So there's a teaser. There is a book coming. But for now, it. check out the podcast, Restaurant Strategy Podcast with Chip Close. Uh, and where, where can they find you online in the social? Yeah, so you can find me at my website, chipclose.com. It's K-L-O-S-E.com. Uh, that will link to the uh, podcast. Uh, you can find Restaurant Strategy anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Um, and again, that community is growing. really proud of what we're doing over there. Those are the best places to find me. Yep. And uh, don't forget Clubhouse. So for all the cool kids that are in Clubhouse, this is where Chip and I met. So yes. um, it's a great place to share information and thoughts and, and absorb, but also talk. And so find us both on there, Joseph Zala and Chip Close. And, and we look forward to engaging with you. Chip, thanks for being on the show and sharing all this awesome knowledge. I really I appreciate, appreciate you having me. Absolutely. If you love what we've served up, please follow us at Vigor Branding on Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Medium. Fork Tales is produced by the team at Vigor. Audio and video post productions provided by Zencaster. Music performed by Jet Trash and licensed through musicbed.com. Joseph handles his own hair, makeup, and stunts. Copyright 2003 to 2021, Vigor Graphic Design, LLC. All rights reserved.